Well, good evening, and welcome, and thank you for coming to Arctic Warming, Changing Planet. I'm Natalie Bowman, and I'm an ecosystem ecologist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. I co-convened this evening's event with Bruno Tremblay, who is a professor at the, in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences at McGill University, who focuses on climate change at high northern latitudes and on sea ice cover. So as you've likely heard and read a lot about lately, the Arctic is changing earlier and more acutely than the rest of the planet. My colleagues and I are here today to share with you, discuss, and answer questions about how the Arctic is changing. We thank the Quebec government office and the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory for sponsoring this event and the Earth Institute for their help with logistics and planning. Special thanks to our invited speakers who took time out of their very busy schedules to participate this evening. Thank you all. And to Andy Revkin, who is going to be moderating the discussion. So I'd like to welcome Patrick Heinemann from the Quebec government office, who has a few words to share with us. And after that, Bruno is going to give a brief, brief introduction for each of the speech speakers. Thank you, Natalie. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this panel, which gathers American and, and Quebec experts around this hot topic of the development and the climate in the Arctic regions. Uh, naturally, uh, the development of the, northern, of the northern regions is of prime interest for Quebec. And uh, I'm confident, I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that the, the tonight, tonight's panel will be passionate, very interesting, and will uh, help us to to uh, answer a few questions, I'm sure. And, uh, and the Quebec government, I must say, is very happy and proud to be a sponsor of this event. Uh, and we really value our relationship with Columbia University. Uh, allow me to voice a special thanks to all the speakers that, are, that made it today here. Uh, also to Natalie Bowman and Tamara Plummer from the Lamont Doherty, Doherty Earth Observatory as well as to my colleague Linda Hansler from the Quebec, from my office, the Quebec office, who, which has been very involved in the, also in the organization of this event. Without further notice, thank you and have a very nice panel tonight. Bye-bye. Well, thanks everybody for coming tonight. The evening will be composed tonight of uh, four presentations by six uh, researchers. So we will have two solo presentation and two uh, combo presentation. Uh, we'll have a moderator tonight, uh, Andrew, Andrew Refkin, and Julie Payette will give the introductory statement like tonight. So let me give you a brief introduction of each of our speaker, moderator, and uh, Julie as well. Okay, so one of the speakers is Kevin Griffin. He's a professor in the department of Earth Environmental Science at Columbia University. His research focuses on plant and ecosystem ecology, and he has been working on Arctic uh, research for the past 10 years. Another speaker tonight is Igor Kupnik. He's a cultural anthropologist and curator of Arctic and Northern Ethnology Collection at the National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institution. His research focuses on the impact of climate change and Arctic indigenous people. I would like to give a special thank to Igor, who substituted for um, Donna Savoie, who was supposed to give this presentation tonight. Uh, for personal reason, he was not able to um, show up, and Igor like, graciously accepted to replace him on very short notice. Our introduction tonight will be given by Julie Payette. She is a Canadian astronaut since 1996. Julie is the first Canadian astronaut to participate in a mission to construct the International Space uh, Station. Another speaker tonight will be Stephanie Furman. She's a professor of environmental science at Barnard College since 1993. Uh, Stephanie works on her research focus on nature and dynamic of Arctic sea ice under changing climate. Our moderator tonight is Andrew Refkin. He is the Senior Fellow for Environmental Understanding at Pace University's Academy for Applied Environmental Studies and writes the award-winning Dot Earth blog for the op-ed side of the New York Times. Another speaker tonight is Pierre Richard. He is recently retired from the Department of Fisheries and Ocean in Canada. 
Dr. Richard, uh, his research focuses on Arctic marine mar mammal, in particular beluga and narwhals. This is it, and without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Julie like, to come and give the introductory uh, word. Thanks. Bonsoir, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to uh, discuss perhaps one of the most uh, interesting global issue that we're facing nowadays, but not the only one. I am here from the experts in a few minutes from now, but people like me, space travelers and space to see the planet from a slightly different perspective. You've seen this photo. It less than 50 years ago, just half a century. It was unthinkable to be able to go away sufficiently from our planet to see it in one glance. We are now very familiar with this photo. Actually, we can't take this photo anymore because this one was taken from an Apollo spacecraft on the way to the moon. People don't go to the moon anymore. But we get to see, I'm trying to change, but we get to see the planet from an amazing vantage point on board the International Space Station or what used to be the, in, the space shuttle. <clears throat> and what we see is an amazing world of blues and whites, of continents. It is our planet, our home, and the only place right now where we can live. It is a dynamic world that is fast growing and being molded by a hand which before only lived in symbiosis, but is now making its mark. And if you don't recognize the region that you're seeing on this photo, it's because the north is not up here like you see on your normal map, but it's actually up there. And this is a mark during an orbital night of how populous we have become and how populous we continue to be. This is New York City and the eastern coast of the United States at night from the International Space Station. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see that our planet is indeed dynamic. We know that. But seeing it in action is unbelievable. At any given time, 40, 50 volcanoes are in eruption around the planet. And you get to photograph them as you pass by at 17,500 miles per hour, as it takes one hour and a half to go around the Earth once on board the International Space Station. So we see that our planet is in the business of churning matter, putting it out. It's in the matter of moving matter, either by splitting it or colliding it. The split is a very ancient city called Istanbul. Clearly those two pieces were together at some point in time in the past. And here's a picture of a small collision of two tectonic plates with the Himalayan mountains, Tibetan Plateau, India, and Pakistan. The planet is in the business of then eroding matter and starting the cycle again. It takes time. And while it erodes this matter like here at the delta of the Mississippi in the Gulf of Mexico, it also bring out those other debris, chemicals, and other pollutants that are produced by that hen that is now carving the planet. And that our actions and the causes that we need to study about it might put in jeopardy such jewel as this one, the Great Barrier Reef and Australia. When we are in space, we see every time we cross from orbital night to orbital day that tiny little line 
that delimits the atmosphere of the planet. Here is life and up there is nothingness. Vacuum, no pressure, and a very, very harsh environment. So this is it. About 60 miles, 100 kilometers thick. And that is where we pump enough CO2 to warm up the planet. We've never done that before. And that is causing changes. We all know it. It's not a debate anymore. It's how it's going to affect what really the data is about that we need to continue focusing on and looking at very closely. We know that as the planet is changing, as the planet is getting warmer, that we will have more extreme climate events. They will be more frequent. They will be longer lasting and sometimes very catastrophic, really. This city knows that more than anybody else. We know that because systems are gonna move less quickly, then long periods of precipitation and long periods of drought will follow. Not every day, not every year, it's over a period of time. Things are gonna oscillate, but the trend is undeniable. Things are getting warmer and it is impacting us. Better know what's going on, try to figure it out, and then adapt as best as possible. This is not new. People have been studying this for a long time. We'll see it with our panel of experts. Astronauts, too, have been photographing the changes since a long time. And it's quite striking, in particular, the Kilimanjaro, because it's the only glacier around in a sea of flatlands and then lower up to the north of the desert. You can actually tell with your own eyes if you fly over at the same period of the year, of course, that things are changing. And things are changing faster, as Ms. Baldwin said, in a particular place in the world than anywhere else. In the top of the roof of the planet on the Arctic territories which, when photographed from space, appear a little different, especially during the orbital night. Here is a beautiful picture of a daily phenomenon called the Northern Lights. Things are affecting not only the marine environment, the eyes, the navigation, the way, uh, and we'll learn that with our experts, that plants grow and, and mammals feed and, and, and fish grow, live, and spawn but they are affecting people as the permafrost melts. And clearly, it will affect those very charismatic characters that most people who talk about the Arctic always show a picture of because it's really important. There's no such thing as a, a, a serious presentation on the Arctic without our friend, the polar bear, but he's probably doomed, at least for a little while. Not completely, but certainly from his habitat point of view. We in the South will be completely and utterly affected by what is going on in the Arctic. The northern latitude's fur change will influence how the climate will evolve in the southern latitudes. We are not separate. And we are not even within separate nations. The planet does not know borders. That's our invention. Climate doesn't stop when it sees a, boarding, a border crossing. It is now a global issue that concerns us all. And even though, unfortunately, even from space, we can take pictures of our complete inability to live civilly and get along, we are still part of one and one planet and we do not want to have to go and move there one day in a distant future, their being. Can you believe that? The surface of the planet Mars, as taken by Rover Curiosity just two weeks ago, 
so that we don't have to move somewhere else if we do conduct an uncontrolled experiment on our world. But we're far from it. And as long as we keep looking, searching, collecting data, talking about it, and influencing the policy makers and the decision makers so that the best proposals and the best directions are taken, then we will continue to evolve nicely and peacefully. Have a good evening. Okay, so tonight I'm going to be giving you like the, the usual pitch about Arctic climate change, what's the variation in ice extent and ice volume. But I would like to also show you, like in the second part of the presentation, a recent observation, a measurement or modeling experiment that we've done regarding the role of the ocean in the melting of sea ice. So these are like fairly new things, and I want to like bring this up here, like in this event, because uh, this is not something that we've heard talk about like very much in the past. So this is a picture that many of you may have seen. Um, since 1979, like satellite has been orbiting around the Earth, looking down the surface, and every day getting a picture of what the sea ice extent looked like. And when we look at this minimum sea ice extent, which usually occurs at the end of September or middle of September, what we see here, I'm sorry, what we see here in millions of square of kilometer, uh, sea ice extent, and here at the bottom, is uh, uh, the years. So the first thing that's very striking is there is a decline. And recently, in 2012, like we've crossed almost like the 50% threshold, meaning that we've lost about 50% of our Arctic sea ice uh, cover in the Arctic Ocean in the last three decades. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, there were anomalous wind patterns that were such that they were blow blowing sea ice outside of the Arctic. And we could almost, we could say that, well, maybe like the loss of multi-year ice in the Arctic, maybe the loss of ice extent in September is somewhat related with anomalous wind pattern. In the last decade, the wind has returned to their uh, normal uh, condition and the sea ice has continued to decline. Not only that, it's, it's been accelerating. I'd like to focus your attention here on the last, like following 2007, like uh, historical record. 2008, 9, and 10 saw like a, a somewhat recovery of the ice extent. But when you look at the sea ice volume, well, during that period, the sea ice volume here continued to decline. So ice extent is a very nice like measure of like uh, to monitor like the condition in the Arctic Ocean, but more importantly is the volume of sea ice. Like, you can expand in area, but the thickness of the ice might actually continue to decline, and the volume might continue to decrease. So this is modeling evidence, but highly constrained like modeling evidence. It's coming from a biomass model. It's forced with um, winds and atmospheric condition from reanalysis. It's uh, assimilating sea ice extent from satellite. Okay, so it's like a highly constrained and it's matching very, very well like the um, recently observed ice thickness from satellite. So this is a time series that we uh, trust. And just to highlight something, we've reached 50% of the ice extent. Here we have lost 80% of the sea ice volume in the last three decades. So 50% in area, 80% in volume. Okay, so what about the role of the ocean in all of this? Uh, I think the message I want to pass here is that I believe that our view of the role of the ocean in the sea ice mass balance was tainted by the fact that when we go to the field, we set up camp in the middle of a sea ice flow. This is the camp here. We go in the middle of the sea ice flow on a very nice stable platform, and what we see is an ocean that gives us one or two watt per meter square, very little heat of ocean origin coming up to the surface and affecting the melting of sea ice. So the question that I want to raise today is, What if when we went to the camp, uh, set up our camp in the Arctic, what if we were to set up camp at the edge of the flows? At the edge of the flows where you have fracture, where sea ice flows are actually moving relative to one another, and where you impose on the ocean uh, a mechanical forcing which is discontinuous in space because you have sea ice flows which, which are, uh, um, whose speed are, is different just across a lead which can be a few meters to a few kilometers. So what is happening? How does the ocean react to such discontinuity in surface uh, forcing, which are uh, associated with fracture in the sea ice cover and the resulting deformation? So this is the satellite. This is 
the Arctic Ocean, Alaska, Eurasia, and then northern Canada. And this is basically the sea ice cover and the lead in the sea ice cover as seen from satellite. All red line here is a place where you have a fracture and you have the formation of ice and flows sliding relative to one another. This is the representation in a high resolution four kilometer ice ocean model. These are the lead representation. They are not as numerous, but the one that we have are very active, just like in the real world. So what I would like to focus your attention on here is this lead here and this lead there, and what is the impact of having leads at the surface and discontinuity in the surface forcing in the ocean underneath. Well, I said before that uh, we don't like to set up camp at the edge of flow, and this is one reason why we don't like it. At Chiba in 97, 98, the De Groseillers, like locked himself up and actually weakened the flow, and then there was a, um, a fracture right at the camp. And this is like a ridge that formed after this fracture. And this is the tent, actually, of like uh, Bob Pinkle, who actually lost like a lot of his instruments. So there are reasons why we don't go there, but sometimes, by mistake, we end up in those regions. So again, focus on this lead, and let's look at the, an animation from an ice ocean model. This is a lead. Look at the formation of this lead here, slowly focusing. And look at what's happening in the ocean here in terms of vertical velocities at 40 meter depth, which are actually extend anomalous velocities that are extending hundreds of meters below the surface, which are actually uh, bringing heat of Atlantic origin, which is situated in this place, and bringing up the surface. What we see in this region is ocean heat flux of the order of three, 400 watt per meter square. So very localized in space, very localized in time, because a lead will actually last for two, three days. But leads is an ubiquitous feature in the Arctic Ocean, and you have them all over the place. And while they are very confined in space, the, um, the amount of heat that are actually pumped up at the surface associated with these phenomena is actually uh, very significant. So here we see it again, lead pumping up heat from the depth. And here you see another lead forming, and again, like organization here in the ocean bottom bringing heat. So it's basically you have a lead, you have, and you're pumping up heat from beneath, which is actually bringing loads amount of heat, uh, of energy, which, is, um, which, is, which can affect like the sea ice uh, melt. So it's interesting to note that where you have the most lead activity in the Arctic is in the Beaufort Sea. And this is also where you've seen like this year, like in 2012, a vast amount of sea ice uh, lost. And this is really a region where we expect very, very uh, thick ice from north of Canada here, which are being advected here by the Beaufort Gyre into this region. So really, this is something that we don't expect. We expect thick ice to be uh, advected in this region, and yet this is the place where we see most of the uh, melt. And I want to propose that maybe ocean heat is responsible for that. So this figure shows like all of the um, GCM participating in the latest uh, IPCC effort. They all show a seasonally ice-free Arctic in the Arctic, like uh, somewhere in the, in the not too distant future. And Stephanie Furman here will talk to you about what are the impact on the ecosystem and other, other things like in the Arctic associated with the loss of the sea ice cover. So Bruno and I have been working together on this for a while because if you take a look at these projections, you can see that there's this, oh, I can see what he was doing. You can see that there's this very um, steep decline um, in sea ice extent, but what was, in, what was intriguing us was this fact that most of the models actually show some sea ice extending into uh, the next, uh, towards the end of this century, so for decades into the future. So we were interested in looking at where is this ice? Is it in a stable place? Is it patchy? Is it distributed all over the Arctic? Because that has really big implications in terms of habitat maintenance and structural um, um, hindering structures and, and um, traffic as well. So we can't, you know, say exactly where this ice is going to be, but one of the interesting things that we can do is look at where ice is... Okay, this, I want the animation to run, can you? Yeah, 
can you click it back there? So this will be an animation of Arctic sea ice age. It's really difficult to actually measure ice thickness because you have to go underneath the flows to do this. So you can model it, or what you can do, as is done in this animation here, is you can track the age of the ice. So the white ice is the oldest, and the um, dark blue ice is the youngest. The old ice is ridged, as Bruno showed in that picture, and it gets very thick. So where you see this nice patch of white ice banked up here against the northern coat flank of Greenland and Canada, that's the oldest ice. And you can see that in the beginning of the time series, you have a lot of this old ice, and it's getting less and less as you move towards the end. We're now at 2003, and this time series goes all the way up to 2020 excuse me, 2012. So now we're here, and you can see this old ice is being banked up against the north coast of Canada and Greenland to the extent now where there's hardly any old ice in the interior of the Arctic. This is a really dramatic change. Um, when I first started working in the Arctic in 1980, the whole central part of the Arctic Ocean was covered with thick old ice, and now you just have this extent of old ice banked up in this one region right here. So this ice is just as you have a snowbank here in the, in the, you know, along the side of your driveway or, or something, it takes longer to melt. And so this is where the, the um, ice is going to be retained for longest during the summertime into the future. If we take a look at this, this is, has a different color scheme, but you can see it here in this color scheme, it's red. And if we take a look at the model results now, you can see them sliding in, and the models project that this is indeed where the, the ice is going to be. We're calling this the last sea ice refuge or the last ice area. This is in the summertime in September when ice is, is missing from much of the rest of the Arctic Ocean. We're projecting that there's a likely likelihood of retaining ice for actually decades into the future into this one area. The reason for this is that the winds and ocean currents are basically blowing and transporting the ice across the Arctic and it's building up in this region here. And we expect this to continue into the future. If you take a look at what the impact of this might be, clearly you're losing ice. This shows projected projected changes in optimal polar bear habitat. So this is looking at the ecosystem impacts of this. And again, you see this last ice area where the habitat for polar bears will be maintained and may actually improve to some extent here north of Greenland and Canada, but it will be lost in the rest of the Arctic peripheral seas of the Arctic Ocean. So th this will have really dramatic changes um, for the Arctic ecosystem. If we take a look at um, how, what what the sources of ice are to this area, we can see that they are, here it is again, this ice area here. We did backward trajectories, sort of backing up the ice to where it came from. And this, the, the origins of the ice are in part ice that's, that's formed and grows locally within the, within the uh, last ice area. But a lot of the ice is actually transported in across the Arctic Ocean. So this has really big implications because if you want to consider this to be a special area and you want to manage it with that in mind, then you can't just take a look at these regions here. You have to consider what happens in the central Arctic and maybe even some of the peripheral seas. Some of our work and work of others is showing that Arctic sea ice is speeding up. So as it becomes thinner and there's more fractures and cracks, as Bruno was, was, um, was talking about, the ice is more mobile and can move around more quickly. So it's possible that you can be moving ice across uh, the Arctic Ocean in fairly rapid um, time frames. So if we take a... Um, Sorry. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to um, draw awareness to this idea that this, there is a special region within the Arctic Ocean and that the ice shed that's feeding this area actually is quite uh, large. So what that means is that when you're thinking about development or contaminants or potentially shipping, or oil, oil development, that sort of thing, you have to be thinking about the ice in this region and not only where it's forming and where it is right now, but also where it might be in the future because that it can bring any contaminants that get entrained in the ice with it. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to clean up oil, for example, in ice-covered waters with present technology. So to conclude, as Bruno said, the Arctic sea ice area is, has declined by nearly 50%. The ice volume has declined by nearly 80%. The ocean, as Bruno pointed out, may play a much more important role than we um, th previously thought. This last ice area, there's a strong consensus on where its location is and that it may be in this position for decades into the future. And these changes will have implications for the social, biological, and physical systems of the Arctic. Thank you.
Good evening. Thank you for having me. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, uh, the, impa the impact of uh, or either observed or uh, predicted impacts uh, of all of this on uh, Arctic marine mammals. Um, um, I'm going to repeat a few things just to set the, the tone, but the, um, uh, Arctic, uh, the Arctic uh, sea ice uh, is experiencing a progressive loss of, and we're talking about summer sea ice. As long as it's cold uh, in the winter, uh, sorry, dark in the winter, there'll be sea ice uh, forming, but uh, that uh, platform is uh, progressively disappearing in, in earlier and uh, and and uh, forming later, and uh, therefore for marine mammals which uh, rely on that uh, for various uh, aspects of their, um, uh, their life cycle, um, there are uh, big changes to come. Um, thinner sea ice, uh, uh, less snow on the ice, and that has an impact on uh, particularly a ring seal. So um, I'll talk about the consequences uh, on Arctic marine mammals. And I'll pass over these because you've already covered that aspect, both uh, the ice extent and the thickness of ice, and uh, make a, a sort of distinction of the various uh, marine mammals that are found in the Arctic. There are those that are ice-obligate marine mammals that essentially rely on an ice platform for breeding, uh, resting, and or feeding. Um, and the um, most um, notable one are a ring seal and its predator, the polar bear, which is obviously attracted by the presence of enormous amount of ring seals on the sea ice. And um, uh, in fact, spends, uh, uh, polar bears spend most of the winter feeding on them. Uh, spring is actually a very good, uh, big uh, part of it. Walrus also uh, use uh, sea ice, uh, particularly in the uh, Chukchi region, uh, where uh, the sea ice platform uh, used to uh, exist over their uh, benthic or feeding beds or the, the shallow uh, beds where they found uh, clams, their main food, and that's retreating fast. In the, Can the Canadian Arctic, it's not as uh, dramatic. They, they seem to have been adapted to, uh, to uh, land haulouts uh, more so than the Pacific walrus. Bearded seal. Uh, is also a benthic feeder, so it, it feeds on similar foods to uh, walrus, but has a more varied di diet. But for the same reason, the loss of uh, uh, summer uh, sea ice is, is uh, changing their habits and affecting their population dynamics. Um, then there are ice-associated uh, marine mammals. Uh, um, uh, those are uh, marine mammals that use uh, ice at a certain time of the year, but are adapted to the marine environment. So they, they spend uh, uh, less time on the ice uh, than the, the previous species that I mentioned, and, but they, uh, they do have some aspects of their life cycle which uh, takes them, they're pagophilic or ice-loving mammals. Uh, harp seals particularly, uh, 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 hooded seals, uh, breed, uh, rest, and molt on the ice. Ribbon seals, the same, and those are ribbon and uh, spotted seals are more uh, Pacific uh, uh, species. And uh, then there are the cetaceans, or the whales, uh, for whom ice uh, is uh, an impediment, but it's also a refuge for, of some kind. So they, and uh, they will find uh, food under the ice. Um, have uh, species of uh, uh, fish or, or invertebrates that uh, are uh, that breed under the ice in the, in the product uh, the ice has a production capacity uh, because it's somewhat transparent uh, and then you have the seasonal migrant uh, marine mammals those are the ones that are impeded uh, by ice and in fact uh, uh, their uh, distribution is limited by sea ice but as the ice retreats, they start, are starting to invade uh, Arctic regions and, and possibly compete with the, the Arctic-adapted uh, cetaceans. And, uh, and those are mostly uh, uh, cetaceans. Um, 
I've yet to hear about a pinniped or a, 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 a seal a, a species from the Atlantic that is invading the Arctic, uh, uh, or a sea lion, uh, but uh, that's possible in the future. Uh, those are killer whales, fin whale, minke whale, humpback whale, blue whale, and gray whale. And uh, now, for those species that have been clearly shown to be affected by climate change, the two species are ring seal. Ring seal, uh, uh, as I'll show, uh, uh, breed on the uh, sea ice and uh, nurture the young uh, there. And uh, 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 with uh, loss of sea ice, there's reduced uh, 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 sur survival of newborn. And um, on the other hand, uh, reduction of sea ice may lead to better uh, prey availability for, uh, for uh, adult uh, ring seals. So it's uh, uh, some is good and some is bad. And uh, the uh, demographic, uh, demographic uh, consequences are still under study, but uh, there are indications of declines in some places. And uh, or fluctuations due to uh, changing ice conditions. Uh, polar bears, that's been covered uh, extensively. Uh, uh, reduced feeding season, reduced hunting efficiency. Here are a few photos showing uh, ring seals uh, in a collapse uh, snow layer at uh, the top uh, uh, left. Uh, you can see a, a snow layer that's been excavated uh, uh, here uh, at the top right. And of course, uh, seals uh, use uh, uh, holes in the ice to um, uh, go and feed under the ice and then uh, haul out uh, to rest. And so they spend a major portion of the year on the sea ice. So that's why they're considered uh, ice obligates. There you see a pup on the lower uh, right corner, which is, um, it looks like it's uh, been uh, in a spring. Uh, freezing rain, and that's a problem for the survival of pups. If they don't have the protection of the lair, uh, the time where they don't have the fat reserves to uh, thermoregulate, they may uh, actually die from exposure. And uh, polar bears, as we've mentioned, are, uh, feed essentially on ring seals. Uh, I particularly uh, like the, the young seals in the spring, as do the Inuit for that matter. Um, so, uh, somebody else is going to talk about the impacts on the Inuit. Uh, um, and, uh, but the efficiency of, uh, you see at the top uh, left is a, is a layer that's been excavated by a bear and, and it's red uh, in the hole, so that means there's been a kill. Um, now, as uh, the ice breaks up and uh, thinner ice means uh, earlier breakup, and then the feeding efficiency of polar bears diminishes drastically. And so they're much better on a, on a more stable and, and uh, complete platform than they are on a, on a floating pack. Uh, that's, that they, ha they have to swim in between the flows and then they have to be very careful approaching the seals. It's quite a feat for a bear to catch a seal uh, on, a, on a nice flow as opposed to a, a continuous uh, pack. I Consolidated packers. Uh, the species that are hypothesized to be affected by uh, climate change, and the, the research is only beginning on that. A uh, uh, lot of the problem we have with uh, studying marine mammals is the population dynamics are very hard to uh, uh, study because we don't have enough samples like, like we would f say for a fish. Uh, um, uh, species where you can get hundreds of samples and understand the, the the demography of the species uh, and compare it uh, from year to year. You can't do that. Uh, there's n even if you use uh, uh, samples from Inuit kills, you won't get enough samples to, to do that. So a lot of it is speculative. Uh, uh, so the, the uh, speculation is that uh, for beluga, narwhal, and bowhead whales, the uh, prey availability uh, could be a positive increase. Uh, but uh, prey range may change, and the animals may have to either adapt or, or, or be excluded from 
species that they normally would have uh, found in, in particular places. And we have evidence that, uh, that uh, these species are, are philopatric, in other words, that they always come back to the same places every year. They tend to have regular migrations between wintering range and, and summer range. Uh, so that could be negative unless they adapt, so maybe uh, driven by uh, uh, the fact that they don't find their prey, they will change their, their range. We don't know that yet. Um, well, we have some indications that individuals have ranged further into the uh, uh, central Arctic, for instance, but uh, it's not a large sample. So it's mostly anecdotal. Uh, on the other hand, uh, predation will increase uh, from uh, particularly killer whales. Uh, killer whales, uh, as I'll show later, are invading uh, the Arctic uh, further uh, and uh, predation opportunities for them are, are increasing as the ice retreats. And where, th where these whales would find refugia in the ice, they don't have that anymore, so they have to go in, into other places like uh, up fjords and, and in, in shallow bays to escape uh, that, that predation. In fact, uh, those animals are terrified of uh, killer whales. They, they'll pack right against the coast. Uh, Pacific walrus, I mentioned the loss of platform over feeding beds, particularly in the, in the Pacific region or the Chukchi Sea. Um, that's negative. Uh, predation uh, increase uh, by uh, uh, more killer whales, that's uh, hypothesized. Uh, that would be negative, but uh, I, I'm not sure we have the evidence for that yet. Um, harp seals, hooded seals uh, are, ooh, laugh. Loss of uh, breeding uh, platform. Uh, um, uh, you've heard in the news that uh, harp seals are um, uh, pupping, uh, whelping in the, on the, the ice off Newfoundland and in the Gulf of St. Lawrence are not finding uh, as much ice as they used to. And in fact, some of the harp seals uh, are uh, uh, going to shore to have their young and thereby being exposed to predators, uh, land predators. So it's a different uh, ball game for them, and, and we'll see how that uh, affects the populations. Uh, hooded seal, uh, similarly, our uh, uh, ice platform uh, breeders. And uh, on the other hand, uh, is it possible that uh, uh, change, uh, increase in uh, fish production may be a positive thing? That's a questionable uh, hypothesis, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, killer whales seem to be uh, uh, having access to more uh, Arctic uh, marine mammal prey, and there are hundreds of thousands of whales in the, Ar in the Canadian Arctic, uh, at least, and, and elsewhere uh, around the, the Arctic, and uh, um, not to mention uh, millions of seals. So they have access now to hunting territories that they didn't have, and we're seeing more and more as I'll show here, um, there seems to be an expansion into the, uh, the Hudson Bay, uh, into the uh, central Ar archipelago uh, in the Canadian Arctic, and you're st we're starting to see more and more of these uh, evidence of uh, predation on, uh, this is the uh, fluke of a, of a bowhead whale. Um, and uh, all sorts of uh, stories from the Inuit about uh, seeing uh, uh, packs of 20 or so uh, killer whales attacking beluga narwhal and so on. And uh, at the bottom is a graph that shows the increase in sightings of killer whales over the uh, about uh, fif uh, 50 years or so. Uh, the other change is uh, with uh, warming uh, seawater and uh, a reduced season of, of ice on, um, uh, you're seeing uh, earlier uh, br blooms of uh, plankton, which uh, essentially drive uh, a lot of the, the uh, ecosystem uh, er, um, in the open water regions. Um, there's a lot of productivity under the ice, but nothing compared to what the, the productivity of open ocean is. And, and uh, that results in... Uh, it, uh, oh, here's uh, actually a uh, Scripps uh, um, uh, 
map that shows uh, how uh, earlier uh, blooms are, are prevalent in the Arctic region. Um, of course, uh, climate change means that there are some regions that actually get colder and others that get warmer, but definitely the Arctic's getting war warmer and the spring blooms are getting earlier. So blue is uh, early. And uh, so that's, there's a lot of predictions on, uh, on what's that going to do to the uh, food webs, but uh, that, that's, nobody uh, has uh, answers. It's a complicated topic and it's very difficult to do oceanographic research in the Arctic. Um, but uh, in the last uh, few decades, there's been considerable effort to that uh, effect, and that, has, uh, th that is uh, uh, providing uh, some elements of, of solutions, of understanding. And finally, you have uh, summer migrant species uh, are, are uh, not only migrant species coming earlier, but uh, are they staying the winter? Well, you, you remember this uh, famous uh, picture of a uh, gray whale uh, being caught in ice in Barrow, Alaska in 88. Well, now uh, uh, some people have been recording uh, uh, calls of gray whales in the middle of winter in the Beaufort Sea. So we're starting to wonder uh, what's happening there. And that's just one example amongst uh, many. I've seen uh, humpback whales, uh, northern bottlenose whales, uh, and... Uh, um, uh, minke whales and so on uh, in places where they've never been seen in the Canadian Arctic. So there is a, there are uh, new species and those species are, are likely to compete with uh, Arctic species for food. Um, that uh, so the, uh, the the positive effect maybe of increased productivity for Arctic species are able to, to switch prey may be counterbalanced by this competition. So I'll stop uh, right there. And uh, thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name's Kevin Griffin and I'm a terrestrial ecologist here at Columbia. And together with Natalie, we'd like to introduce the terrestrial Arctic tundra biome to you and talk about why it's so important and how it might be influenced by climate change and itself uh, influence the rate of climate change. So I'm gonna start by talking about the basics of the system, where you find it, how we define, how we describe it, and then think about how it's changing. So what you're looking at is, is a map of the current distribution of the Arctic tundra biome on the left. And all the tan areas, circumpolar there, you're looking straight down on the top of, of the North Pole, the tan areas represent the tundra biome. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing a predicted map of the tundra biome by the end of the century. And what you see is that in some places it's completely lost, in others it's very much migrated to the north and filled in with the boreal forest from the south. Now, this is a picture of the typical tundra biome, and I hope it gives you the perspective of a wide open landscape. It is a low diversity but highly important landscape that is easiestly defined as a zone of continuously frozen ground or permafrost. The winters are quite cold, the summers are quite mild, and it receives relatively little precipitation. So it's a very dry environment, less than four inches a year in many areas. And most importantly, the growing season is very, very short, and it is a season of nearly continuous light. So as you look across this landscape, you don't see a lot of variation, but actually there's quite a bit going on, and over the course of thousands to tens of thousands of years, 14% of the world's carbon has been stored in these ecosystems. 
And that's what I want to focus on from the point of view of climate change. So Arctic plants, like any other plants, provide this conduit, this movement of carbon from the atmosphere, where it exists as CO2, into organic matter, the living plant. And here it's concentrated as organic molecules in leaves and roots and stems. Of course, as those stems and roots die and turn over, the plants die, that that carbon eventually is added to the soils, again in a highly concentrated form where we see the accumulation of dead organic matter. The process, the cycle is closed as decomposition then returns carbon to the atmosphere. Now this process is no different than any other ecosystem that you might think of or other plants. It, these plants are not particularly large, this process is not particularly fast, but the important thing is that for for the last 10,000 years, it has essentially been unidirectional. It's gone from the atmosphere through to the soils, and these soils are the permafrost soils where that carbon is then captured, frozen into the permafrost. And what we're concerned about is what will happen with warming. The physiological process of photosynthesis certainly is sensitive to warming, and the initial response may be an increase in the rate of carbon sequestration. However, as we get bigger plants or potentially different plants, the rate of addition to the soil system will also increase. But what we're most concerned about is the rate at which decomposition itself, highly temperature sensitive, may return that carbon to the atmosphere. In terms of the plant communities changing and having a significant effect on the rate of carbon return to the atmosphere, we know this is already happening. You're looking at paired photographs where the upper photograph was taken in uh, 1949, the lower photograph in 2000, and you can see a significant increase in woody shrubs. This is commonly talked about as woody shrub invasion in the North Slope, and as you accumulate woody shrubs in the these formerly tussock grasslands, you greatly change the complexity of the system. Here you can see, compared to any other of the plants I was showing, that we have very tall vegetation by tundra standards and a very complex ecosystem. As you increase complexity within the plant canopy, we're looking at a situation where new habitats will be created to support uh, tundra fauna, but importantly, we'll see a change in the energy balance of the system. This change in the energy flux will certainly increase water flux, potentially having detrimental effects on drying of the tundra. It could increase uh, canopy level carbon gain, but importantly, higher, taller, more complex shrubs trap more snow. And as you trap more snow, this tends to have an insulating effect on the soils and make the soils slightly warmer in the winter. Warmer winter soils then increase microbial decomposition, that big red arrow returning carbon to the atmosphere, and uh, could promote ecosystem carbon loss. This uh, diagram then lays out what we've been observing and what we continue to be concerned about. In the upper left-hand side, in a, uh, in a current situation where the permafrost is intact, we see a lot of carbon stored within this permafrost and a generally neutral carbon balance where photosynthesis bringing carbon in is matched by respiration and decomposition, releasing carbon back out. Now as the permafrost system starts to deteriorate and melt, we may initially see in the middle panel an increase in photosynthesis driving the accumulation of carbon and perhaps initially the gain of carbon by the system. But ultimately this process of gaining carbon through photosynthesis will reach a maximum whereas the decomposition thawing of the permafrost would continue and in the last panel under the warmest conditions we see a net loss of carbon from the ecosystem. These changes then 
takes tens of thousands of years to accumulate the carbon, this 14% of the world's carbon in the tundra biome. It takes hundreds of years to see these changes, or decades to perhaps 100 years see changes in the species composition. But there's also phenomenon going on which are changing the tundra much more quickly. This is a massive tundra fire that began in 2007 after an incredibly uh, dry summer growing season, a lightning strike once rare on the North Slope, now particularly uh, increasing by perhaps as much as 300%. Uh, causes uh, tundra fires at a much higher frequency. And this fire is so large, about 100,000 square, uh, 100, square kilometers, 10% larger than the five boroughs of Manhattan, that you can again see this from space. So you're looking at a satellite image of the northern part of Alaska, and down in the uh, lower right-hand corner, you see this area that burned in 2007. So in a very short period of time, releasing as much carbon as the entire tundra biome would typically accumulate in a single year. So very rapid changes affecting the carbon balance of the ecosystem, and as the carbon balance changes, the functioning of the ecosystem changes as well. And that's what Natalie is going to tell you about. So the changing tundra landscape that Kevin just showed us um, provides food and shelter for tundra wildlife. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, this complex diagram shows you a typical tundra food web with predators at the top, herbivores and birds at the heart, and arthropods or bugs and plants at its base. What I'd like you to take away from it is that each one of these, each one of these boxes represents a different each one of these boxes represents a different group of animals or plants. And the many arrows represent the many dependencies among each of these groups, suggesting that if something were to happen to one, one group, this could have a domino effect through the food web. <clears throat> now, this sort of complexity exists in almost every ecosystem. And in fact, the tundra's food web is relatively simple compared to others. But what's special about the tundra is that it has little backup among species in terms of the ecological roles that each one plays. This lack of backup means that if we're to lose one species as a result of warming, we're likely to lose one or more important ecological functions. And this makes the tundra particularly vulnerable to climate change. Although to date not many studies have looked at the, at the cascading impacts of Arctic warming, there's mounting evidence that several examples of this domino effect are underway. For example, Arctic warming has resulted in warmer winters, and these milder conditions have meant more rain on snow events and more, free, uh, sorry, more melting of snow that refreezes, both of which form an ice crest formation on top of the snow that make it really hard so that small mammals can't puncture through it to reach the, forage, the plants that they forage on. In northern Scandinavia, they found significant crashes in small mammal populations, such as voles and lemmings. And this, in turn, has caused crashes in their predator populations. In my own research, I'm focusing on how Arctic warming can ripple through one branch of the food web. So many species of, Arct of migratory songbirds actually breed up in the Arctic. <clears throat> and they do this because relative to other ecosystems, the tundra offers lots of food, few predators, and very few parasites. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Right, but as the, as the Arctic changes very rapidly, we want to know how will this impact the birds. So as Kevin pointed out, the tundra is becoming shrubbier. What we found is that the shrubs harbor more insects, more bugs for the birds to eat. But at the same time, it also delays snowmelt. These tall shrubs trap blowing snow very effectively in the wintertime. And this builds up a deep snow layer that takes a longer time to melt out in the spring. So this delay in snow melt results in a delay in the uncovering and availability of berries and seeds, which are the only thing that the birds have to eat when they first arrive on the tundra after a very long journey. The other thing we're finding is that 
While some species will nest only under tall shrubs, others will nest only in open tundra. And so as the tundra gets shrubbier, it's very likely that some species will win and some will lose. Perhaps most interesting is that my one of my colleagues, our collaborators on this project, John Wingfield, has found that as shrubs expand northward on the north slope of Alaska as a result of warming, white-crowned sparrows, which is a species of songbird that nests only under tall shrubs, have expanded their northern range limit 60 miles north in just the last 10 years. The second question we have relates to the fact that tundra growing seasons are getting longer as a result of warming. So this can happen either through an earlier start to the growing season in the spring or an extension or and an extension uh, of the growing season in the fall. We want to know, can the songbirds keep up to this early start to the growing season? So this green panel here is showing the progression of the tundra growing season. And the blue panel shows indicates that bugs are most abundant at the end of June and the beginning of July. Both of these processes, the onset of the growing season and the emergence of bugs in the tundra, are controlled by climate. On the other hand, migratory songbirds leave their overwintering grounds every year, every spring, on, um, based on changes in sorry, based on che seasonal changes in uh, day length. So they are light cued. So they arrive on the tundra every year at around the same time, which means they, and the minute they get there, or very soon after they arrive, they form breeding pairs, and they wind up having chick, chicks to feed or young to feed in perfect synchrony with when the bugs are most abundant. But we want, what we want to know is, if the onset of the growing season and the emergence of the bugs is controlled by climate, and climate is changing, but the songbirds keep arriving on the tundra at the same time because they're only paying attention to day length. If a mismatch will develop between when the, birds have, when the birds have chicks to feed and when their food resources are most abundant. So we're looking to see whether this mismatch is developing and what sort of repercussions it has for the reproductive success of different species of songbirds. So the tundra is a very long ways away but it should not be thought of as out of sight, out of mind. For example, these migratory songbirds connect the tundra ecosystem with many other ecosystems all over the world. So anything that happens to these birds as a result of warming could, for example, impact who, show, who and how many show up in your backyard bird feeder every year. The American tree sparrow, the dark-eyed junco, and the American robin are examples of species of songbirds you've probably seen around here in the winter and who travel up to the tundra to breed or have populations who travel to the Arctic to breed every summer. But even if you're not a songbird enthusiast, you should consider that songbirds play a very important role or they offer us ecosystem services such as uh, insect control, seed dispersal, and pollination, and they are also an important food source for local predators. Another example of a global impl implication has to do with the, the diminishing or crashing of caribou populations as a result of Arctic warming. Uh, Eric Post and Sean Cahoon have found <clears throat> that in the absence of trampling by caribou and muskox, the tundra is allowed to become more shrubbier. It becomes shrubbier. And as Kevin had mentioned, these shrubs can hold on to more carbon for a longer period of time thereby keeping this carbon out of the atmosphere. But on the other hand, as you also saw earlier, these shrubs increase the susceptibility of, of the tundra to fire. And large fire events can release huge pulses of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, thereby contributing to further warming. So I wanted to leave you with this last message that unlike in Vegas, what happens on the tundra doesn't necessarily stay on the tundra. Good evening, I'm Igor Krupnik, I'm cultural anthropologist, and as you heard, I study what indigenous people of the Arctic think and talk about climate change. And I'm waiting for my PowerPoint to get on the screen. <clears throat> yes. And uh, as the only social scientist on this panel, I will also give you a little tour of history of how we learn to look at Arctic people not as victims of climate change, but as partners in research and knowledge, 
and also as fellow citizens who face enormous new challenges because of climate change. So when, when did we first learn about climate change and when did we first learn about northern people? And that happened probably about in the mid-1990s uh, as an outcome of a series of workshops that were influenced by the first and the second IPCC assessment reports and also the beginning of the U.S. Global Change Research Program in 1990. And I put some of the titles of those reports, the covers and the images. And from there on, uh, we learned very quickly the prospective impacts of climate change on northern people and northern environments. And these has been, have been identified, as I said, about 15 years ago. It's increased coastal erosion, the thawing permafrost, warming weather, advance in shrub vegetation, increase in tundra and forest fires, change in species distribution, reduced access to subsistence resources. So all these things were known to us for about 15 years. And uh, what is interesting is first how little we actually knew back then, how little data we had back then, and actually how truly were those predictions about what's going to happen into the Arctic. So by that time, the Arctic was also called, as everybody knows, canary in the coal mine. And those images of the limping houses and, and cracked roads and, and uh, damaged shorelines became as familiar images and messages of, of the coming climate change as was the famous hockey stick graph and the polar bear on the shrinking ice floor. The tipping point in, in our understanding of Arctic climate change came around about 2000 when the concept of what is called Arctic amplification, so the, 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 the mechanism that makes the Arctic warm faster than the rest of the world has been finalized. And that, that very image that the Arctic is going to, to, to war much faster and with many more consequences was solidified in the influential Arctic Climate Impact Assessment Study, a major study that produced a thousand volume scientific report and a 200 page uh, more popular version uh, for policymakers and general public. And I was on the team that, that worked on the chapter on indigenous perspectives on climate change. And during this process, uh, the chapter that was originally number 13 in the 15 chapter volume became number three. So somehow we kind of inched up substantially in, in, in general vision on why it is important to look what indigenous people see in Arctic climate change. And of course, the, the Arctic residents have been noticing changes in the environment for quite some time, uh, but their voices were not yet heard or they were not recognized as, as solid evidence. And here is the cover of the first real true study with, which, which was based on Arctic people's indigenous knowledge. It's called Voices from the Bay, from the Hudson Bay. It was a Canadian project that produced this very first analysis of what Arctic people knew at that time. And what we learned by, by 2000, by 2002, is that across the Arctic, people are seeing a sustained signal of change. It's not like they are seeing something in one place and something in another place. It was a sustained signal of warming that goes from all across the Arctic. And that was the first book that we published in 2002 that summarized this early research uh, in, at, at sites in Alaska and Canada and what was interesting then is that Arctic people actually, here are some of the books that we produce after that, that Ar Arctic people actually view uh, climate change or changes in the environment very different from how scientists view this. It's not like they, they particularly notice warming, but all, everywhere we ask people or everywhere people have a chance to talk, they talk about increased uncertainty. They talk about increased unpredictability. They, they talk about instability of, of their environment. They talk about a rapidly changing weather wind and, and weather patterns. They talk about floodings and storms. 
They talk about new risks of going on thin ice. We heard something of this earlier in, in other presentation, and I would say with the exception of going on thin ice, everything else is very familiar to this audience because of the Hurricane Sandy and other catastrophic events of, of recent time. That position of, 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 of Arctic indigenous people and their knowledge was advanced even further uh, during the International Polar Year, 2007-2008, which was a major research program uh, in both northern and southern polar, polar areas. And for the first time, uh, indigenous knowledge of Arctic people gained recognition and needed resource boost uh, so that you can see the list of major projects that were done with Arctic people or initiated by them. So why do we need indigenous knowledge? Why do we need Arctic people's observations? And what is there so specifically intriguing and interesting to us? Uh, first of all, we have many more monitors in the Arctic as indigenous people than we have scientists. And my, my usual joke is that this community, the village of Gamble on St. Lawrence Island, where I've been working for the last 15 years, can put on ice and climate and weather watch more experienced people than the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And these people watch their ice and weather 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And they watch the same size. They don't have project time. They don't have project reports. It's their life just looking and watching. So you have many more watchful eyes and many more experienced eyes doing this climate monitoring. Uh, and what is also very, very important that those people, you can see some of the faces. Uh, these are project monitors uh, from different communities uh, who worked on, on, on a major project that, that we run during the International Polar Year which was called SICU, Sea Ice Knowledge and Use. And those people documented for two or three years, some of them for five years, daily, uh, weather and ice conditions around their native communities. And you can see, look at those faces. These are very experienced people. They know what they're writing about and they know what they're watching for. Also, indigenous people have higher resolution of observation. And this high resolution of observation, we are talking about local scale. You know, they don't have satellite imagery, they don't have buoys, they don't have uh, all kind of air, air photography. But at the local level, they have very high le level. They have very high uh, level of resolution because they're using many more indicators and they're using many more terms to watch and interpret their environment. And this terminology, this kind of monitoring is based, is rooted in indigenous terminologies for ice, for snow, for weather. Those famous talks about Eskimo having 300 words for snow. Well, while this is not very true for snow, uh, with regard to sea ice, we did document that in, in most of indigenous communities across the Arctic, people use several dozen up to 100 plus terms for different types of ice and ice conditions. Uh, that allow them to do this, this high-level observation. And that image shows you a walrus with a cuff and the, the terms for different types of sea ice recorded by, by that man who was our local observer and my co-author on this sea ice Inupiaq dictionary. Arctic people also work as teams, something that scientists do very rarely or kind of not, not necessarily. They share knowledge, they exchange, they cross-check. Every unusual signal in the community is always thoroughly discussed by dozens of experienced people. And, and as Arctic people say, if you're stingy with your knowledge, it will, ro it will rotten your mouth. So people share information and people, people do teamwork. What is actually happening is that we are providing Arctic people's observations, which is citizen science, with modern technologies. With, with GPS, with, 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 with satellite imagery, uh, with uh, what is called cyber cartographic uh, models to use. This is, a, this is a sample page from the Inuit Sea Ice Knowledge Atlas that is being built by our Canadian colleagues. Now to, to switch a little bit, since our time is very limited, a few words about Arctic people being our fellow citizens. 
this, uh, our partners in, 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 in global warming are not only the source of valuable knowledge, but as I said, they are also our fellow citizens now at high risk. And what happened in the Arctic is also very familiar. Uh, in the past 50 years, those small coastal communities uh, that were built on the barrier islands or along the shores were transformed into modern towns. And as they were transformed, and modern infrastructure has been built dangerously close to, to, to the water, it is completely unprepared by what happening in the Arctic in terms of increased storm activities, erosion, the rise of the ocean, high tides, and all kinds of catastrophic events. As a result, 178 Alaska Native communities have been identified as being at risk uh, for various forms of coastal erosion. And those were not only the placed along the shoreline, but also on the rivers, because now uh, seasonal, particularly spring rivers, uh, river discharge going as major floods. So flooding, surprisingly, is becoming the main, the main face of climate change to Alaska indigenous communities, as you can see, that are built dangerously close to the rising waters. Twelve communities are already considering plans or started initiating uh, relocations from being because they are built so close to the rising waters. Some of them are literally sandbagged for six or seven months a year, and the cost of the relocations is, is, is hugely expensive in the north. We're talking about like two million dollars per family to be relocated to, to a new place. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for small communities of five to six hundred people and of course the resources are lacking and the goodwill is lacking and the political will is lacking and this is again very familiar to, to this audience you know who will be moved first where did we get where how can we get resources to to protect our communities from from this from this from this aspect of climate change so I'm using the graph that you already have seen to tell you that Arctic warming, it's everybody's bell. And the, the, the 2012 uh, sea ice minimum is not only a dipping point on, on the curve, this is something that affects us all, and that is something that is already affecting thousands of our fellow citizens up in the north, in Alaska, and in the Canadian Arctic, who are facing climate change on its front lines. Thank you. So now we're really going to have some fun. Um, and it will involve the audience uh, after an initial round of questions involving the panel. What an incredibly rich um, array of findings and observations. My first question, uh, by the way, I'm Andy Revkin. I written about climate change since the mid-1980s, getting to be kind of a, a gray beard on this beat. Luckily, I've been able to go from the, from the Amazon to the North Pole itself as a reporter writing about this stuff, and the Arctic tundra in December, which I'm sure some of you have experienced, and when I went to Dead Horse, Alaska to look at the warming tundra and how it was impeding the oil companies trying to, trying to get new oil out of the ground. And, um, and then I was in Greenland um, in 2004 so I've kind of seen scientists in the field, and it's great that you've gotten to hear um, a briefing from, from many of them now. So my first question is whether any of you have a strong reaction to any of the other presentations so far that you've heard. Anything that, that relates to your work? Is there interrelationships here that you want to just point out or that you question uh, in a, any other way? So just I'll give you 10 seconds, and if not, then we'll move on. Anything? Yeah, yeah Igor. Yeah, I would just say that how remarkably in agreement we all are. This is very important. We are very different people. We, we, we do different kind of science. We, we, we work in different fields, and I believe we are all in agreement of what's happening. Yes. And, and I absolutely agree. I was going to make the same point. You must have noticed that some of the, some of the photographs were the same. The graphs were the same. For the good reason that usually in, in science, 
we all use the same data. Uh, a glass, when dropped, falls to the ground at the same speed, and we all agree on that, and then if one new data comes at the table, then everybody revise their model and everybody will present the new data once it gets uh, accepted within the community that it is, it, it is valid. And this is what is the beauty. It is not made up. Right. It is what it is. Right. And then you deal with it. Right. I've learned something new from our presentations, but uh, I particularly liked uh, what Igor said, uh, and he presented you know, with people like, uh, as uh, active participants, people who monitor the CIs as opposed to just like simply a victim of climate change. I think it's very important like, to, uh, I, think this, I like this image like, of the Inuit people, and uh, thanks for doing that. Yeah. Um, um, Natalie was talking about a uh, possible disconnect between the food production of uh, migrating birds and and uh, uh, the tundra insects that they feed on, and they feed their young. Uh, that's something that's been hypothesized for marine mammals as well. If, if uh, the, the food chain uh, uh, happens earlier than the animals uh, are there to take advantage of it, there, no indication that as yet that that is happening, but that's certainly something that needs to be looked at. And the other point is that uh, uh, Arctic marine mammalogists uh, can't do much work without the Inuit because much of the work that we do um, uh, involves uh, Inuit in, uh, in helping us uh, uh, determine where uh, our efforts are best placed, but also uh, it, through the, um, their subsistence catch, uh, we are able to get samples that we wouldn't get otherwise. Uh, so we learn much from them, not to. Uh, the interactions, the stories, uh, 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 the uh, understanding of uh, what are good uh, marine mammal habitat and so on. So it's essential. Stephanie, you have a thought? Right. One thing that I thought came through strongly in all the presentations was just how interconnected the system was. So if you, if you change this in this way, then it will have this ripple effect uh, through the system. And I thought both um, the discussion about the tundra and then also the marine mammals, there were some aspects where you know, certain species might thrive. Um, or at least for a short period of time, but then what, what is the impact of that? You know, in many cases you're going to be losing species, but then what happens when you, know, you have other ones taking over? So my, my first question is about the, one of the fundamental aspects of the system is that it amplifies uh, climate change. In other words, when it gets a jolt in the positive direction, it seems to go, as, as we know, climate, greenhouse theory has shown for a long time, a little global warming creates a lot of warming up north. Um, and if things cool off temporarily, the, the system responds. Ice thickens over time. Um, and there was work at, that I reported on in 2004 on Arctic flora that showed a, that they've been much more adept at responding rapidly to climate change because they're essentially attuned to a system that's dynamic, that has a lot of big ups and downs because of its nature. And I, I wonder if you have a sense of that what we're seeing is one of these hiccups. Is this system biologically more resilient because it's a more changeable environment uh, in that sense? It's an amplifier of change? Uh, one, one point I would make is that uh, given the steep gradient in environmental conditions, that a small linear migration results in a large change in the environment. So uh, Arctic plants can and vegetation systems can migrate at a rate that in some instances can uh, move northward or southward a small amount, say uh, a tenth of a kilometer to a couple of kilometers, that can help medi uh, mediate, mitigate against changes in the environment. And I can add to that, just to give the animal perspective on this, is that it's true. We see huge swings in interannual variability in the Arctic. You have one spring that, you know, the birds arrive and the, the tundra's covered up in snow. Another one, the next one, they'll show up and it'll be already uncovered. So it's true, they have 
th they are faced with huge variability in conditions. And what we're finding is that species who have been on the Arctic for, in, in the Arctic for a long time have these fine-tuned coping mechanisms for dealing with this. But other ones that haven't been around for quite as long are not able to cope with these, these huge swings. And, and uh, we, so we don't know how they're gonna be able to cope with persistent changes to w in one direction or the other. Uh, Igor wants to say something, but actually, Natalie, Natalie you, I wanted to ask you, that was an incredibly cute lemming. What was the story with that lemming? <laughs> I took it from... Are they all that cute? Yes. Yeah, they're really okay. cute. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to be anthropomorphic, but anyway. Igor. Well, we know about the Arctic people that they are very resilient. <clears throat> and not only we know it from historical records, they keep saying how resilient we are. But also we know from science, and that was an old paper by Max Dunbar, uh, that Arctic systems are resilient, but to be resilient, they need space. Means what? Need space. Yeah. They need space for quick movement, for expansion, for contraction. And what is happening today, particularly with regard to Arctic people and to the ecosystem as well, is the shrinking space. As, as long as Arctic people are now being concentrated in smaller amount of larger communities, they're losing their main mechanism of resilience, which was space, dispersal, quick movement, same with the infrastructure. So traditional infrastructure was very resilient because it was very dispersed and there were many places where people could go. Now with the cost of, of maintaining this infrastructure, with the cost of relocation, so that resource of resilience that used to be there is shrinking. I won't say it's not there anymore, but it's shrinking. Which relates to, um, well, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is whether it's ecological systems or social systems, there are multiple stressors at work here. Um, alcohol, uh, a cash economy, um, there are many t tough stresses on indigenous peoples, whether they're in the Amazon or the Arctic. And when you have that associated along with these other factors, then you end up with a lot of cultural change and maybe you know, the end of certain aspects of culture. By the way, and that leads to one other thing. You know, in, in the time I've spent, the short time I've spent in parts of the Arctic, the, um, and with in Inuit at meetings, they're split too. Because, I think because of the pressures, some Inuit are more uh, supportive of going to a cash economy and having oil and gas uh, and mineral re income. And you know, if, if it means giving up some of their traditions while others are digging in on the traditions. So there isn't a simple, uh, um, answer there as well to some extent. And I'm not saying any of that's good or bad, it's just a, an observation I've had. Yeah. I, again, in your dealings with the peoples up north, I don't know if anyone else wants to agree on I concur with this, I just don't want to talk about this just to save time. For, sure, for, sure, for okay. <clears throat> um, so, uh, the system in flux, rapidness, um, multiple stresses make it hard to figure out what's going to happen. Um, and this leads back to what Stephanie was talking about, something that I've written about, this idea of shifting to a new management norm in the Arctic and other places that are experiencing rapid change. Um, I've been attracted to the, this concept of a re looking at the sea ice patterns <laughs> using modeling and observations. And that, that, can gives, that informs countries, the Arctic nations, who have all kinds of relationships already on how to manage that system. But it's very different than the 20th century uh, sort of environmental argument was about uh, using the Endangered Species Act, for example, as a tool to protect polar bears from climate change. It seems to me a total and totally, it's a, the wrong tool for the job. Looking forward, I, I, maybe could you talk a little bit more about what I would call um, a conservation strategy for the Anthropocene, this era in which there's fast change, some unpredictability, but some things we know well. You know, where polar bears might have a good time in 2080. And uh, how does that, what does that lead you to, what's the prospect for making that happen? Right. I think a, a lot of people are looking more towards resilience rather than vulnerability. So rather than saying this is off limits because a species is endangered, people are starting to think, well, there's going to be multiple stresses, there's going to be multiple interests, and how can we optimize um, the situation so that we're, we're managing um, the habitat at the same time that we're managing the livelihoods. So I think, I think it's a really, it is an, a new way of looking at things, and in fact, we. Um, we ran a, um, a, a simulation, a marine spatial planning simulation in a course here at Columbia just the other day. And one of the students said at the end, but where was the environmentalist? And by that they meant where was the person who was saying, you know, this is all off limits. And I said, but th this is not so much the reality right now. People are trying to think about how to, how to manage the, the multiple interests. I'm gonna, one more question from me maybe before we turn to the audience. And this is about 
stepping back from the specifics and regarding the changes that are underway just as human beings, most of us grew up mostly in the 20th century. I'm sure there's at least a few people in the audience who actually have spent more than half of their life in the 21st century. <laughs> so we all, we have a completely different perception of what's, of the Arctic in our head. When I grew up, uh, my dad had a book about Peary and the poles, you know, and it was all this frozen wilderness where people didn't go except for Eskimos who, who were clad for the job. And, and now my sons and anyone who's young now is growing up with the norm of the Arctic is, in cha is changing, polar bears are imperiled, and um, so it's a, it's a that's normal for them. And this is, gets to the sociologists who talk about one of the impediments to action on global warming is what's called, um, or actually other environmental issues, shifting baselines of perception. So for, for young people today, it's like a no-brainer that the Arctic is the system is in stress. That's their norm. And how do, you, how do you deal with this, like when you talk to your kids, or has this come up for you as an issue where you've seen um, where, where you have that feeling of loss that you don't see reflected in others? I just don't know if anyone's had that. I think when, when we saw the, we had projections from early on um, that the Arctic sea ice was going to be lost, but when it happened in 2007 to such a dramatic extent, the cli climate scientists really took notice and they, yeah. it was like, oh no, this is happening now, this is happening within our lifetime. We had thought that it would be, you know, from the, the modeling projections, it was going, we, had th we knew it was coming, but we didn't know it would be coming so soon. And then when it happened again this year, and to an even greater extent, I mean, this, it really is something that, that you, um, you feel viscerally because it's something that you've been sort of concerned about, but now it's here and present. The kid I teach at McGill seems to be, they seem to be more concerned about, about uh, environmental issues than the climate change I, I notice, like uh, things like uh, overfishing or like uh, harvesting of forests like in um, too large quantities. They seem to have this faith in the human, like uh, things will change and we will uh, adapt, but uh, our way of dealing with the environment and climate change is just one more manifestation of our way of dealing with the environment. But there are also like maybe, maybe even more pressing issue like of uh, like a link with overfishing and link with we're talking about like acidification of ocean. But will there be any fish in the ocean left like in a few yeah. decades with the overfishing and the fishing practice? They seem to be more concerned about these kind of practices. Uh, the one I teach at least. This is true. In fact, just the last 24 hours, I was writing about the latest um, uh, outburst of po poaching of elephants in a national park in Kenya, and. Uh, one of the realities we have to consider in weighing priorities, including me as a communicator, is where to focus our attention. You know, I can only write so many blog posts in the course of a week. And uh, when I see an utterly avoidable and, and hor horrific uh, intentional harvesting of elephants, it, it, it has that kind of visceral uh, quality. Um, and this issue, these issues like climate change, again, which I've written about for so long, You've, there is a background aspect to it. it the, the background forcing is a gradual thing that le can lead to disruptions, and it's, it's been a hard issue to, I'm sure, for everyone here to, to communicate. Igor, you were kind of leaning toward the microphone, did you? Yeah, I, I want just to say that Arctic people who are on those front lines were not only the first to notice climate change, and I think they did it probably at least a few years prior than, than scientists did it. They also were the first to learn how to live with climate change. And this is very important. And that's another very important experience that we have to tap into. Uh, and in talking to people in the communities, uh, you always hear this kind of a reassuring message that, that we, we, we will learn, we already learned how to adapt to the changes. Give us the resources, give us the means. Don't interfere in our life with all these regulations they, they, that prevent us from hunting at a certain season because these are mismatches as we have heard. There are many more mismatches because of hunting seasons of big animals have, have shifted as well. Give us the power to change our life and we will do it. And this is something that probably we all have to learn from, from people who are experiencing this really for the past at least 20 years. I'd like to turn to the audience. There are already some people queued up in the mic. Uh, there's a microphone there, so if you want to Let's start with those, at the very least. Okay. And say your name and keep it a question.
That's a yes, and there's many ways to show you that, but what's causing it is a different question. How much of it is human-driven? How much of it is, uh, is um, variability? Uh, how, how, how warm things are going to get by 2100? Right. Um, no, there is. Yes. yes. That's a yes. 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 We have very limited time, so let's move to the next question. Thank you. creating a, a tension around that. It does, and Andy already alluded to this. Uh, like we the, just started drilling uh, in the Chukchi Sea off the north coast of Alaska. There are two nearby communities, Point Hope and Wainwright, that will be heavily affected by, by not only by the drilling itself, but all these operations, infrastructure, the anchoring oil, building pipelines, with huge amount of cash to be flown into this community. So Wainwright is, is, is welcoming the, the, the new era with, of course, several exceptions. Point Hope is adamantly against it. So uh, it's, it's all divided, the house is divided, and uh, there are many people who, not only the elderly, but the young ones, who understand the lure of the new resources, but nonetheless, are very, very keen on preserving their way of life, their environment, their resources, because that's the only thing they have. And that is something that, you know, you think t twice, three times to give for cash alert. I have a question regarding uh, one of the key components of global warming, which is going to cause a tipping point that will be totally uncontrollable, and that is the billions of tons of methane that is uh, frozen in the permafrost. As that comes out, and methane has 30 times the global warming effect than carbon dioxide, we will reach a point where there's nothing humans can do to stop a massive uh, global warming and the melting of the, you know, raising of sea oceans by 100 meters or whatever. Any quick thoughts, Bruno? Yeah, regarding tipping point, I mean, uh, tipping point kind of implies that you go from one state to another and you can't come back. And uh, if we reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere, we will come back to a nice uh, an Arctic uh, ice-covered ocean. So. There is large nonlinearities, and we can go from one state to another state, and, uh, and definitely, like the probability of us returning is very, is very small because we keep putting more CO2 in the atmosphere. Regarding methane, uh, we published something recently with um, Igor Dmitrienko. Uh, there were a, p a paper published in uh, Nature, I believe, where they were looking at um, the waters in the Eurasian Shelf were saturated in methane, and they were saying. G, like, uh, and we also published a paper earlier about penetration of Atlantic water onto the Eurasian shelf. And basically warming of those Eurasian shelf water, which seems to imply like uh, instability of the methane there in the, in the, in the ice form, like in the, in the soil. So but we, joined in, we joined forces like with the uh, modelers and permafrost modeler, and it seems to me that, it seems to like the, what came out of the study is that uh, the saturation of the water in methane in the Eurasian shelf is, is more like a, uh, like a long-lasting effect from the, from the last glaciation, basically, right. and then we're still adapting to this. So, and basically, like by the time like the Atlantic will really have an impact on the Eurasian shelf, we were more like speculating about like hundreds of years from now where you can actually like lead to an instability and we could have problems associated with methane. But right now what we're seeing is really like us coming out of the last ice age and then like just responding to that. 
And one other aspect to that what, um, is that what I understand from a lot of scientists is that the, most of the volume of methane is deep enough in the system that it's kind of like the turkey that you have to start throwing, thawing now to get it ready for Thanksgiving in a couple of weeks. Most of that mass, it takes a lot of heat to, um, to melt the turkey, mm -hmm. and it takes a lot of time. Is that, is that part of what's going on? <laughs> Uh, yeah, d definitely, yes, yes. Nice so just keep the turkey effect. <laughs> <laughs> it's our salvation, maybe. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Um, the first is for Dr. Krupnik. I was hoping you could speak to any caveats that are associated with uh, using traditional eco ecological knowledge, um, such as like contradicting observations and stuff to that effect. And the second is for the entire panel. Um, I was hoping you guys could share any like social media tools for citizen scientists. Uh, something that I can think of is like MapMill is an organization that has, uh, I guess like satellite imagery that citizen scientists can click through to show effects of Hurricane Sandy just to, you know, incorporate or more of the of public, uh, just increasing public awareness, rather, and participation. Okay, I'll start first and I'll be very brief, because I was asked to summarize almost 20 years of my research in a 15-minute talk. <laughs> so there are many, many caveats in using indigenous knowledge, and actually we have so much data now that the crucial problem now is not to get more data, but to learn how to read it carefully and rightly. So yes, there are tons of caveats that I unfortunately couldn't mention in my talk, so I, I'm, I'm sorry for that. This is totally unrelated, but there is an open science effort underway right now to get samples of sediment from people around the region whose property was flooded by the hurricane. So uh, if you search for sediment, Revkin, and it's on Twitter, I twi tweeted about it. They're looking for, uh, Vassar is looking for samples of, uh, give us your sand, give us your mud. Totally different, but it shows you the promise of doing this kind of thing. Next, next question. Hi, this is for the entire panel, I guess. Um, has data from the thousands of nuclear weapon detonations on this planet since the 1940s, including the hundreds of detonations in Novaya Zemlya, Russia's, Russia's central test site, and nuclear waste stores located in the Arctic Circle, been factored into the models and predictions of the cause of sea ice melt and climate change? And if not, why, why not? Oh. There, um, a lot of the original modeling work was on sea ice um, trajectories and distributions was actually in part to understand what could happen if some of these vessels were to rupture. So we were looking into that at the time, and we've been, you know, using that information um, as kind of um, more more as a tracer. Um, what you're talking about is it's that it's generating heat that would be melting the ice. And um, I think that the, the scaling of that just it wouldn't work. Um, and the, you know, if you just look simply even at the patterns of where, where the, most of the ice is, is melting and where the radioactivity is you know, with the reactors, you know, it, it, that's very localized in the Arctic. There were some similar discussions a few years ago about, ago about the volcanic eruptions on the seabed, and uh, people were asserting that that was causing the melting. But, but I, everything I heard was that couldn't work because of the basic heat transfer physics. I don't know. It depends on the, the it's a very small amount. Too. So small amount. It's a yeah. very small amount. And the ocean is pretty stratified. Right. That's exactly. What Bruno was talking about the surprise with the with the ocean was that you were able to get this convection. Uh, talking to the mics. Yeah. yeah, in the Arctic, like you have a surface mixed layer, and beneath that you have the Atlantic waters, and in between those two layers is the cold alkaline waters, and those waters are a very good insulators of like uh, of heat transport from the Atlantic water into the mixed layer. What I was showing in the animation is that there are places where you have sea ice lead where you can actually pump heat of Atlantic origin into the mixed layer, and these occurs in very localized places. But if you have one volcanic eruption at one location, I mean, in general, like, there is a barrier in between uh, the surface waters and the deeper waters, which is a cold alkaline waters. Actually, before we go to the next question, I want to ask the audiovisual folks, were you able to load that video? Is that it? Yes? Uh, just briefly, this will just take one minute. Uh, if you could show this video, I want to show you what one of these leads looks like. When I was at the North Pole with scientists who were trying to test that understanding of the layers of ocean, uh, just if you click uh, start. You won't, hear this. you won't really hear the sound, I think. Oh, maybe you will. This is one minute. 
So there's the sea ice. This is the camp on the North Pole sea ice. And we landed in a Russian helicopter. And it's really cold. <laughs> and so this is a, this is a Polinia lead. This is an open patch of water. This was 2003. That water is 14,000 feet deep. And this idiot was testing the ice. <laughs> And just to show you how dynamic the system is, um, there are cracks and, and forming all the time. This was thick multi-year ice that you heard about. And when it collides with itself, you get these ridges, which is the opposite of, the opposite of one of those cra uh, openings. And he's an oceanographer, Tim Stanton. He, 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 I said, can you, do we have to worry about this? Should we step back? He said, no, you can always jump over a crack. <laughs> so th that gives you the idea of what we see, up, what, what this looks like up, up close. Uh, next question. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Is it Payette? Pierre? Pierre? Yeah. Um, you gave us this wonderful, which we have seen, uh, picturistic uh, look at the planet from afar. And as you were describing that, um, for me, you touched a nightmare that you didn't want to go towards, but it's, and you verbalized that uh, here's Mars, and we really don't want to go there. And I thought, wow, that's a, 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 a nightmare of a dream. Would you be so kind as to uh, go deeper into that thought and let us know what would be the circumstances that you feel as an astronaut that the species would have to leave the planet with an objective of relocating? And do you see uh, a capitalistic Mars? Do you see a Christian Mars? Uh, do you see a McDonald's on Mars? And give us your Mars interpretation, please. Wow. Uh, well, yes, wow. Um, first, I, I'm sure you've all noticed that my presentation was tongue in cheek. Uh, um, you're all very learned uh, and, uh, and all very versed in, into the topic of today's discussion. Uh, I was trying to just make it a, from a different perspective. Now, about exploration, definitely we should always push the frontier of knowledge wherever it is. And currently for space exploration, our frontier was the moon, though we haven't been back in more than 50 years now almost. Um, and the next step one day for, for us will be to go to another planet, a feat we've never accomplished. And when we do, I would say that my vision for Mars is that when an expedition does reach it and lands safely and walks on the surface just like we have for rovers, that whoever does that will do it in the name of all of humanity, not just one or two nations. Um, my dear, I was at a meeting in which, uh, uh, which was called the Capitalistic Interpretation of uh, ex Space Exploration, and the gentleman made a presentation that he had bought the Russian rover on the moon, and therefore the land that the rover had traversed upon now belonged to him and his family in the old tradition of planting the flag. Um, but thank you. Um, I'm not so sure to be that humanistic. Thank you very much. Yeah. If I may just add, right now, up above our head, the <laughs> International Space Station is housing six astronauts. It's been permanently inhabited for 12 years as of November 2nd. On board, three Russian, two American, one Japanese, but this changes all the time as we rotate the crew. Do you hear much about the International Space Station in the newspaper every day? No, though it has been built in the harshest possible environment led of Antarctica and, and, and the Arctic, and it is controlled by five different mission control in Moscow, Tsukuba, Japan, Houston, Texas, and Munich, Germany, with a small, um, a small outlet for robotics in Montreal, Canada. And we don't hear about it because people are getting along. Clearly, though, it is a very small subset of what you would find. And as we expand our presence in lower Earth orbit, we'll bring with us more of our human problems, but also of our human beauty and our human creativity. Uh, we'll see how it pans out. One thing is sure is we're not going to stop exploring. 
That's a great thought. Um, I wish I could tweet from up here. I'm just taking notes, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write it up later. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. Yes, I'd like to um, talk about politics a little bit more, although it may be beyond the scope of this panel, but anybody who would like to could respond on the total lack of uh, climate change being a discussion in the presidential debates or in the entire campaign, except for perhaps Mitt Romney's comments at the Republican convention that Obama wants to stop the seas from rising, but I just want to help your families. Um, do you think uh, in a second Obama administration, the, uh, the president will be more empowered to seize this on this issue and, and also be able to work with a, a, a very resistant Congress to, to actually affect any any change in American uh, policy, because without that, uh, China, India, and the rest of the world will, will not change. It, this is directed to anybody who would like to come in. Mm -hmm. I have thoughts, but I'll, I don't know if anyone there is brave enough. You're American. <laughs> I'm Canadian. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm Canadian, too. Well, I mean, British Columbia has the, got, got a carbon. When the question was asked of the panel, you know, is the planet warming? And we all said yes. So uh, we all up here are very concerned about the changes that we're seeing up in the Arctic and in the rest of the world. I mean, I think what we're seeing up there um, is the um, is sort of sets, sets the stage for some of the implications that are going to be, you know, rippling across uh, the rest of the globe. So we definitely feel the need for people to pay attention to this, and that's why we're doing events like this. And so we would definitely hope that the government would be, um, you know, paying attention to this as well. Never. <laughs> right. I just wrote so, a I so just wrote a piece for Dot Earth. Um, what can Obama do to uh, improve the planet on a budget? And there's a bunch of answers. But so go to Dot Earth and you'll see a discussion of that. Yeah. So well, the, the funding, the actual I, science funding is, is I could say, question. so the National Science Foundation, for example, uh, we, we have a, a grant that's being led here out of Columbia, but involves people in Alaska, the University of New Hampshire, American Museum of Natural History, um, and a variety of other places. And it's working, it's, it, it is based on climate change education, the polar regions, so it's polar learning and responding. And so we were able to, you know, secure funding to, to communicate more about um, the changing poles. In Canada, like uh, we have a very conservative government, government like at the moment, and uh, <clears throat> there is plenty of funding, but it's for it's about uh, producing like sea ice forecasts so that like uh, navigation in the Arctic like is, is safer. So it's really geared at like uh, giving support to mining, uh, petroleum exploration, and so no lack of funding, but not really all directed towards climate. Although there's a new initiative like just recently that was like called out, and this is all about uh, climate as well. Natalie, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that the National Science Foundation uh, funds a lot of the research that many of us here are doing in the United States, but also NASA has just co uh, decided to, or they have contributed a, a large, significant sum of money to fund specifically uh, responses of the terrestrial tundra ecosystem to climate change. So that's another uh, additional funding source that we're getting specifically focused on the Arctic. Igor, you have and there is a common saying that all politics is local, and although climate warming is global, adaptation to climate change is definitely going to be very much local. And of all the states that is probably most advanced in researching and adapting and, and mitigating climate change is the heavily Republican state of Alaska that has already the infrastructure in place for a certain number of years how to deal with climate change and it, it, it went through all Alaskan Republican governors, even those who denied the, the fact of climate warming. And the Army Corps of Engineers has worked with the Alaskan state agencies in preparing all these plans for communities to, to relocate or to strengthen the, the shorelines. So a lot of this will depend upon local efforts. Well, wait, let's go to the next. Thank we have you. only four minutes left, so let's... Uh... First of all, I want to thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful uh, evening with you um, and, and for the creative disturbance that you leave us with. I think my...
question is one of public relations. And I think uh, it's relevant to the comments that have just been made by some of you, and also by our first uh, person who came here, kind of representing the uh, NYPD, who were asking if climate change is real. And you, with consensus and clarity and unanimity, said yes. And I'm just wondering, um, how will your guild, that is to say, climate scientists, earth scientists, how will you be able to find that really public forum? I'm talking about those YouTube videos we see of 100 people breaking out into the Beethoven's Ode to Joy in a Tokyo mall, and everybody pays attention. How will your guild come into a really uh, accessible public forum to say with one voice what we have heard you say today. Um, it's almost like, when is Occupy climate change going to happen with the scientists in the lead because you are our reality checkers? Well, I may be slightly biased, but I think that what Igor pointed out in his slides, he said he used terms like canary in the coal mine. The Arctic is the canary in the coal mine. Um, it's ringing everybody's bell, what's happening up there. So it's a long ways away, but we can learn a lot about what's going to happen down here from looking at what's happening up there. So I think that because things are happening right now very acutely in the Arctic, I think the Arctic is actually a tool for conveying um, climate change to the rest, to, to everybody. And we can say, look, this stuff is happening right now. It's not happening slowly, it's happening fast. Pay attention because it's coming our way too. So I think the Arctic is a tool for this. You were queued up, yeah. Well, I, I can't speak for exactly to, to your point, but I, I can say that over my 30-year career, I've seen that as the Arctic has warmed, I also uh, I've seen a warming of scientists to communicating their results and, and using social medias and, and uh, uh, fairly effectively. In fact, uh, the means to our disposal to communicate is having increase exponentially and and it's amazing and it not only has facilitated the exchange between scientists but it's made um, uh, scientists closer to communicating their uh, data and their their um, views uh, to the public so I think that's an incredibly positive achievement okay. Keep any further responses very brief because we're literally at the yeah, end. Okay, so. with all due respect, don't expect us to come en masse and, and into the streets and say that the verdict of our guild is such and such because we are scientists and we go into the unknown. And we go into the unknown to question, to cross-check, to challenge each other. So the, the spirit of the guild is questioning, not giving answers. And that's how we drive knowledge and that, that's how we drive science. So going to the street is not our way of, 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 of uh, reporting the news. Which, sorry, yeah. Very briefly, and it is true for certain people, um, but I think I would also, as a citizen, I would demand to hear more. Where are we trying to, every single time, and, and it's almost unfortunate, but every single time we're going to have a catastrophic meteorological event like Hurricane Sandy or the fires in Idaho, or, or which, by the way, you can see in Wisconsin and, and New Mexico and everywhere else. I want to hear. I, want, I would like on CNN to hear people, just like uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, explain to me is, what is this? Is this related? Uh, what are we saying? Getting an update. Uh, I think that as a people, we should not just wait till the information comes to us, but ask for it. 
I agree with that. In fact, I, I admonish um, communities uh, when I speak to students to reach out to a scientist. They're actually pretty accessible, and more and more so every, every day. There's scientists with their own blogs, marine scientists, climate scientists, ice scientists, and they're, they're there waiting for teachers and even in underprivileged communities to get the inkling of just setting up a Skype conversation. It's, takes, it's It only takes intentionality and because there, there's no technical barrier now, now to have a conversation. Maybe it's still tough on the space station. You have to have some, some planning. Catastrophe. Yeah, but well, <laughs> planning, no, planning for, you know, for an open call with students, but, but it's completely doable at all these other scales. Uh, if you can, both of you, just quickly state your question and then we can have a wrap up. Okay, I did want to talk about communication, but it has been broached. I wanted to talk about guilt, what you just mentioned. The seven scientists in Italy who were just um, imprisoned after, like, in the oh, wake yeah. of the 2009 Eight. earthquake. Um, so clearly guilt is in play, and I was wondering if you feel you're doing your part to effectively communicate this information, um, and what you see in the future of, uh, in future court, I'm not sure, like, sorry, I lost the question a little bit. Um, what do you see as the future, if you think you're effectively communicating your thoughts to the public? And, and I'm happy. Well, actually, he's going to ask okay. the, final, the last, last question. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll defer asking my question, but I would simply respond to this woman. Uh, there's a remarkable film playing right now in New York called Chasing Ice, mm -hmm. which I think the panel has heard of, and I would urge her to see. It's playing downtown and at Lincoln Center. Great film. So any last thoughts on, again, this just gets back to the role of the scientist as a citizen. And I know, again, as Igor was saying, if I had Jim Hansen up here, who's just a couple blocks away, if he's not in, at some protest right now, I mean, he's, he's locked himself to gates of coal plants and stuff. So scientists are like the rest of us. They, they have a variegated assortment of reactions to that question of what is, what is the role and responsibility of scientists. And there are costs and they come with every, every stance. And the same goes for journalists. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting, I don't think you could expect a simple answer to the question of how you tell your message and how you go forward with this information. But it remains, it remains a challenge because like, uh, we mainly preach the converted, so how do we now speak to the people who actually like, uh, do not believe this is happening? How do we reach out to those who are less uh, likely to believe in, the, in, the, in this issue? I think, I think it's a very, very difficult question to answer. I, th I think that the uh, public often wants certainty and scientists uh, are come up with a lot of wishy-washy uh, answers. Uh, but that is a process of science, is that uh, we can speculate, but we also have to demonstrate uh, whether some of our speculations are, are closer to the truth uh, or, or not. Uh, and that's the difficult part. Uh, that is a big task, and, and scientists need to concentrate on that and rather than um, um, get on the soapbox. Uh, which would take some time from doing the science. Uh, so I, I, I welcome the technology which allows us to share in our musings about uh, uh, the changing world, uh, but uh, we have to balance uh, that against the time that we re is required to do our work. Stephanie, you had a There is some climate research actually being done on communication. So for example, here there's the Center for Research on Environmental Decisions. Igor talked about the changes in you know, people's concern about the uncertainties and how, how things are changing and how you can respond. And so I think that's a really critical area of research is how, how can we communicate more effectively, especially to the people who aren't all currently think that climate is not important to them. So that, that's one thing. And then another one is you, uh, you know, using these new technologies. So that's one of the things that with this Polar Learning and Responding Grant, we're actually trying to use new approaches and novel approaches to reach different people and in different ways. And so I think that you know, it's not, not every scientist is going to go to the street and sort of you know, occupy, but, but there are a lot of scientists who are interested in finding better ways um, to get the message across. Igor, did you have a final thought? And then we're going to wrap up. I will quote our British colleague, Chris Ropley, who together with Robin Bell, who's sitting in this room, uh, launched the International Polar Year in, in 2003. Uh, and Chris wrote very eloquently that um, when, we, when we, the scientists, uh, first face climate change, we believe that the response is better knowledge, more knowledge, more data 
more complex models. And as we provide this more data, more knowledge, more complex models to the, pu to the public, the public would believe us. And according to Chris, we kind of outsourced, outsupplied our audience with the complexity of the planet. It is indeed a very complex system, and it is indeed very hard for people who are not scientists, and even for many scientists, to understand how complex it is and what takes it to change. And so according to Chris, what scientists have to do is to regroup and to rethink their key strategy of addressing climate change and probably make it more, how to put it better, uh, more available to people who not go into complexity every day. I'm, I'm not sure I, I, I quoted Chris roughly rightly, but that's the regroup, rethink, and come again. That's what he says. And that's a good place to stop. And I do encourage you to come to Dot Earth. It's a place where this discussion goes on virtually every day about sea ice or hurricanes and about this critical question of the handoff that happens between this information and public response. And there has to be some comfort level with the, with the reality that the, what we do about all this information is not their question to answer, but society's. And that comes with a lot of complexity of its own. So thanks for, for listening. This was great. I learned a lot.